So uh, by this time, the conference has said just about everything that can be intelligently said about deterrence, except for Hugh's talk, of course. Um, <laughs> So now you've got me. Uh, I am not a deterrent scholar either. I have spent most of my career as a policy practitioner, and uh, now I work at a think tank trying to bridge the gap between the very lofty ideas of those outside government with how policy is actually done in practice by those in government. Spent most of my career at the Department of Defense and then the, the National Security Council. So if I misuse, uh, I'm going to about to make fun of policymakers for not understanding deterrence very well, and I will probably, in the process of doing so, also not understand deterrence very well. So for, forgive me in advance. Um, this conference is about the return of deterrence, but from an American political perspective, it never really disappeared from the lexicon, uh, particularly in the conventional sense of the word. And instead, and as we've talked about before, it was tailored to a lot of different circumstances, uh, to potential threats and challenges in the Situation Room. It's uh, in our strategy documents. People still use deterrence a lot, even though we were in the supposedly post-Cold War deterrence matters less kind of world. And this was done thoughtfully in some cases. Senior officials did make a serious effort to understand how deterrence applied in areas like cyberspace and terrorism and other issues. And to be honest with you, in other cases, it was a total buzzword. Um, so the question I would put to all of you, as we've now spent a few days talking about how deterrence is now more important and we should be placing greater emphasis, emphasis on this in our defense policy, is whether or not policymakers and senior military officials really understand deterrence and what it really requires of them. And I'm not certain that they do. I think it's something that we will have to relearn in a lot of cases, and because, especially because it forces policymakers to do a lot of the things that they hate doing the most. Policymakers hate really having to sit down and argue through what are our interests in a situation. They hate going through hypotheticals. Um, they don't like to think about taking in risks and creating vulnerabilities in themselves. They really don't like pay, uh, to go through lessons learned of the past. Um, they're not all that great at having consistent messages with one another. These are all things that are theoretically their day jobs, but let's be honest with ourselves. They're hard, and they're at the end of the day something that's difficult for even long-term policy practitioners to do well. The conference started um, just as I was getting here from the US uh, with the emphasis on the fact that words matter, and that's been a theme ever since then. Um, and, and they do matter a lot, which is why it breaks my heart to tell all of you that in my experience in the Situation Room and the Secretary of Defense's conference room, the number of times that deterrence and reassurance and its friend credibility were misused badly uh, was basically once or twice a day, if not more than that. And if the folks here had had a buzzer in the room, if any time somebody said, well, we plan to do this to deter so-and-so, like, I don't know. actually, I think, what you're really doing is reassuring. That's not actually deterring. Or we plan to do this, well, this will deter this action over here. Like, well, do you really, are you really willing to take the risk afterward? Like if, de if, this, if deterrence fails, are you willing to follow up on this? Those sort of buzzers unfortunately don't exist in the situation room much as I might have enjoyed that uh, when I worked there. So as we place greater emphasis on deterrence, I want to flag that in practice, policymakers and senior leaders have developed a lot of bad habits around this over the last several years. Less so in the nuclear space, probably so, still so there, uh, in that there's been confusion between how this works and how we should really talk about it. Um, but that's okay, because inherent within the concept of deterrence is the willingness to relearn, to test, to take risk, to see what works and doesn't work. So I think we can persuade policymakers that it's time to go back to school and really understand this again. Here's a few of their bad habits. First, even though this is their, their day job, neglecting to affirm and clarify interest and intentions externally, which is the big deal, but frankly also internally, also hard conversations to, for policymakers at senior levels to have. Here's the thing about deterrence that um, I, I learned when I was in grad school, and it, you will pardon me for the expletive. It requires you to have your shit together. It's really challenging, in a way that's really challenging, distasteful for policymakers. And I would love to say that most senior level pol National Security Council conversations are about very academic debates about our interests and our objectives and our risk tolerance and our willingness to commit to action. 
But often at the end of the day, it's a really busy day, and you're just trying to get talking points to the spokesperson who is just trying to tell the American people, here's what we're doing about a situation that scares them in some way. That's not terribly thoughtful. That's just trying to get through the moment. And as much as I would like to make that the exception, that tends to be the rule in more cases than I'd like to count, even when people say we will be better strategists than our predecessors. Those Obama folks, they didn't know about strategy. We are going to be the strategists. Everyone wants to be the strategists, but it's hard. Um, there's also generally too much of a disconnect between a leader not liking a possible outcome or possible action by an adversary and being willing to do something about it if it happens or being willing to do something to prevent it. And as much as I, I liked my former boss, President Obama, the gap between the words that he said in public about things like the Arab Spring and our willingness as a country and or as a government to follow up on those meaningfully happened a lot. This really hurt us a lot in uh, May 2011. And we were never quite willing to admit that gap of like, we, we said we wanted to prevent certain outcomes amidst the Arab Spring or to deter certain outcomes. But we weren't quite willing to put our money where our mouth was, nor were we willing to tell people, mm, actually, we, we're not all the way there yet. Um, so deterrence means, I guess the last point on that is deterrence means hard conversations, and policymakers like to avoid those as much as possible. They, they have a lot of the things to do. Second bad habit. We've talked about this a lot. Confusing reassurance, compellence, and deterrence. So I'm not going to repeat all of the points that have been made many times throughout the last couple of days. But from my perspective, one of the biggest dangers in this is in the civil-military civil dialogue around what it actually would take to deter from a military perspective. Because policymakers quite often just sort of take on faith, like, oh, if we move this brigade here and this battalion does a rotation here and this carrier goes over here, this is deterrence because that's what it looks like uh, in the movies. This is what it looks like on a PowerPoint slide. The military needs to do a better job, in all of my experience, in explaining that's not actually what we think the, co the cause is going to be. We don't necessarily know, to C's point, we don't always know when deterrence fails or when, re when assurance works. Um, but we can try our best, and we can understand our own intentions and clarify those internally before we go out externally and say, like, this is what our intent is particularly in the development of the European Reassurance Initiative and the European Deterrence Initiative, it was too often in the debates at civil uh, senior policymaker levels a matter of what we could do that was on hand and what we could do that was easy instead of what we could do that would actually work. And those conversations never were too difficult at a senior level to have or would take too much time in the midst of things that felt like a crisis. Next bad habit. Un unwillingness to accept risk. This is sort of inherent with to in the American system, uh, and it's a tough question, the toughest question, I think, in deterrence to talk about whether to deter. Um, for example, the, the Obama administration talks a lot about everything that China was doing in the South China Sea to build up their eventual military facilities there, new construction. But they really, at least in the latter part of the administration, they didn't make a lot of effort to prevent China from doing anything or to punish China when it, as it continued these activities. And Congress noticed this. They said, like, so you guys talk about this frequently. Like, PACOM cannot shut up about it. But are you actually willing to go to war over what appears to be some reefs and shoals? And, and explain this to us, because, like, you're telling us it's a big deal, but you're not doing a lot that we can see. Maybe there's more behind the curtain. And this generated a lot of debate internally, so much debate internally that it didn't really result in a lot of action externally. Um, and as a result, I think the United States ended up projecting, as Dick Bett says, a lot of weakness while also pr uh, being provocative. Not exactly the best look. So sometimes accepting that risk is worthwhile, uh, and the United States needs to get better and more comfortable with being vulnerable and in that position of, we may need to take action in this way, but we should talk about it before we start making big noises about, yes, we will deter China from these actions. Next bad habit is rarely holding to account whether or not their efforts and intentions succeeded. And I totally take Steve's point. Like, you can't really get a yes or no answer at the end of the day. Did deterrence work? Did it not work? But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Because in the American system, uh, my friend Mara Carlin has this great piece in The War on the Rocks called You Get Deterrence, and You Get Deterrence, and You Get Deterrence, the, the Oprah Winfrey version of deterrence. And in it, she goes through how uh, combat commanders in the global force management system will say, I need this, or I need that, or I need this over here, a carrier, a brigade, or whatever else, in order to deter 
Russia or China or whomever else. They've learned that using that magic word deterrence gets them assets because it's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to prove that this didn't work. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look for some kind of indicators of did that actually have an effect? What kind of effect did it have? Did it really not make a difference because we're kind of bad at signaling and telling people about what we're doing? Or did it make a big difference and we should keep doing this and learn from it as much as we can? It's not going to be a black and white answer. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have a better relationship between the intelligence community and policymakers to have these discussions about do these smaller actions that we think are lending itself, themselves to deterrence actually have any impact? Next bad habit, second to last bad habit. Actually following up if deterrence fails. So um, I, I was in the situation room uh, and I think I basically lived there for about a month and a half amid the Syria red line crisis in um, 2014 or so. I haven't, or 2013. Have not quite recovered from that lack of sleep in that time period. But um, the, more, the more deterrence fails, I don't need to persuade you all of this, but the more deterrence fails or appears to fail, the weaker the United States and our allies in many cases are going to look and it will be harder for us to generate greater credibility in cases where we, we need to be able to do so. Uh, and as much as the Obama administration has tried to kind of whitewash over that, red, that use of a red line and that absence of any response afterwards and the continual use of chemical weapons in the Syria context, we haven't quite gotten to a point where I feel like the Obama administration said, like, yes, we handle that extremely well. And I completely understand why us not actually following up on the red line makes total sense and historians will be on our side. Last bad habit is not actually considering when we ourselves have been deterred. That's sort of an awkward situation room conversation. Imagine putting it on the agenda. Have we been deterred? America gets deterred all the time. Like this is basically the kind of the, one of the fundamental parts of the Obama administration was being deterred from action in a number of contexts. And that's not necessarily a bad thing in some of those contexts, but it doesn't really match with our picture of ourselves. And it doesn't, it, we, in not considering this, we're not really thinking through how are our adversaries in our heads? How should we be considering the Russians' perspective on their, in their foreign policy goals, the Chinese perspective, the Iranians and others? And there's ways to do this. Um, Bob Work has this whole series of war games called uh, um, Hobgoblin crazy name, which basically forces players to act in the war game, or sorry, in the table tech exercise, pardon me, from the okay. adversary's perspective. Uh, and, and it's a useful mechanism to think through how is it that we would have responded? How, how is it the at Russia's response in certain situations in different dynamics we wouldn't do all the time? So in closing, I would say that in practice, deterrence is too often a byword uh, to get the capability or the action that you want, or you're just kind of throwing spaghetti on the wall. Uh, and that doesn't have to be the case. Policymakers can learn from how we've done this in the past. They can apply the concepts of deterrence better, but they're going to have to do a lot more homework and be willing to feel a lot more uncomfortable in policy uh, conversations. As I said earlier, deterrence assumes that you have your shit together and you're willing to have the end then what conversations in terms of here's our interests, here's what risk we're willing to take, and we're actually willing to follow up if this doesn't work at all. And if we're not, then we should shut up and per pursue the other strategies that Steve mentioned. It has to be revisited, it has to be consistently evaluated, and it's got to be something that we're willing to feel uncomfortable on. Thank you.